Uh, I'm Deanne Vincent. I'm a health and safety advisor with Workplace NL. And I'm from Cornerbrook. So I drove in yesterday. And I'm going to talk about fatigue. Um, so hopefully everyone had lots of coffee. I won't be seeing any head drops, no one falling asleep. I'll be keeping an eye out. All right. So today what we're gonna talk about is the impact of fatigue in the workplace. Fatigue is something that we all experience. So uh, it's something that we can all relate to. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, like we said before, you need to stand up, feel free, stretch, change positions. Get comfortable, right? So what we're gonna talk about today is what is fatigue? Some of the risk factors. Why are we managing it, right? What's the reasons? Some approaches to managing it. Our organizational benefits to it. And then some also personal strategies. That's my favorite. Um, I love talking about ways we can prevent fatigue. So I got one of my friends, Krista, is going to be keeping an eye on the time for me because sometimes I talk too much and I don't want to run into lunch hour. So, so the first thing, what is fatigue? So it is a state of sleepiness ranging from being asleep to being full awake. The state of fatigue reflects your true need for sleep. It's just not a form of being tired. Right? So when we're looking at uh, our fatigue, our sleepiness, we need sleep in order to recover. So it's a psychological state resulting from insufficient sleep. Quality and quantity, circadian rhythm effects, and also long periods of wakefulness. Uh, I mentioned my... Uh, as an advisor, I deal with healthcare. And a lot of you guys know within that industry, we're seeing a lot of those long periods of wakefulness in our workers, right? So that's some of the things we'll look at. So when we look at sleep-related fatigue, you can see here, it goes from a range, from being wide awake and then we're asleep. So in that middle part that's enclosed in red there, a little fatigued, moderately fatigued or sleepy, and very fatigued, that's where you see a decline, right? You're performing, you're doing your job, but you're not doing it well. Performance is impaired. Uh, receiving information, you know, your input of information is also impaired. Another one we talked about from our keynote speaker, our focus, right? We don't have as much focus on our tasks that we're doing when we're fatigued. But we've got a solution, right? Just like food helps when we're hungry, fatigue, it can be fixed by sleep. So it's already there. We just got to make sure that we're getting enough of it. So like we said, fatigue impairs the following, right? Overall general cognitive functioning, how our brain is working, our ability to problem solve. You know, when you've got a problem and you're, you're fatigued, you know, sometimes it's harder to solve that. Making decisions is another one. Memory, how many, how many of us when we were in school, we pull all-nighters when we were in university, trying to stay up, cramming for those final exams, right? And you know what? It doesn't help. You're better off getting a good night's sleep, right? It's a waste of time. Uh, memory, uh, attention and vigilance is another one. And the last one that we note here is reaction time. You know, when you're fatigued, your reaction time is not the same. Driving, you know, that's the big thing that were happening. A lot of people are on the road, paramedics, you know, tractor trailer drivers. If they're fatigued, their reaction time is not there. So how much sleep do we really need, right? 
Scientific research, seven to eight hours in a 24 hour cycle. Who got seven, eight hours last night? Put your hands up. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Wow, more than I thought. Excellent, way to go. What about uh, six to seven? Okay, yeah, not bad. Who got less than six? I did. My problem, I stayed up too late, had caffeine in the afternoon, all kinds of factors led to my uh, tiredness and sleepiness last night. The other thing about sleep, it occurs at night at the same time. Just like our children, we want to make sure that we instill a bedtime. Same goes for us. Oops. We need to make sure we're doing that same thing. We need to make sure that we're having a bedtime that's the same and the same in the night, in the mornings when we wake up. Another point when it comes to sleep, you don't want to be interrupted by awakenings, right? Anyone here with small children? Awakenings through the night, right? They're coming in, you either they're crying or they're coming in your bed. What about pets? Anyone have pets in their bed, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> More pets. And same thing, though. When they move, you wake up. Does anyone find that you're waking up more throughout the night with your pets in the bed? So that's something to look at, right? Um, just remember, one night of five hours of less of sleep can increase your risk of fatigue. So that's some of the things that we look for is, you know, making sure you're getting that good period of seven to eight hours sleep a night with little awakenings as possible. So we're going to look at some factors here. And some of them are common. You may have heard of them before. The first one is uh, acute sleep disruptions. Chronic sleep disruption is another one. Continuous wakefulness, circadian rhythm, medical and psychological conditions, illness and drugs. And then the last one that we probably hear a lot of is sleep disorders. So those are the uh, six factors. So when we look at uh, the first one, our acute sleep disruptions. So when you look at the quantity of your sleep is less than eight hours of normal sleep in that 24 hours, in the last 24 hours, did you get less than eight hours sleep? So if your sleep is less than six hours immediately preceding the 24 hours, it significantly increases your risk of fatigue. So what we're looking for is a balance. We want a balance between a good quantity and a good quality sleep. The other thing is that the more awakes you have, you know, that's going to throw you off. That's going to give us fatigue. So through the night, those periods, the more periods you got, the more fatigued you're going to be. So the next one, chronic sleep disruption. So it is insufficient sleep or experiencing sleeplessness for extended periods, right? So if you, it is a sleep debt of eight hours or more of accumulated over greater than immediately preceding 24 hours. So some of the things that we look for, you know, uh, why was there chronic sleep? Is it too noisy where you're sleeping? What about, is it too hot or too cold? What about light? Light is so important because what happens is that sunlight keeps us awake. Our bodies, we all pro produce uh, chemicals within our body. And as it gets dark, our body produces melatonin. That's a natural we don't take it as a supplement or anything. That's what our body produces. So when it gets dark, you're starting to get tired. That's our own internal clock working for us. So that's some of the things we want to look for when we look at chronic sleep disruptions. The next one, continuous wakefulness. It's uh, an infestation sleep or experiencing sleepiness. Oh, sorry. It's uh, 10 hours of continuous work 
right night work that can result in dangerously high levels of fatigue. So what about our health care? Guys, I'm going to stress that because that's what I know. That's my industry. I deal with um, the health zones. I deal with paramedics, home care agencies, all of those things that are out there. And I got to tell you, you know, easily, you know, they're working 12-hour shifts. Firefighters, 24-hour shifts. It is, right? And the other part that I've come to learn is when people have been mandated um, during after they've worked a 12-hour shift, they're mandated for another 12-hour shift. Sometimes, in some instances, that person is responsible for passing out medications because of lack of staff. They they are, have those responsibilities. So the next slide I'm going to show is talking about how reaction times we got. Um, 17 hours of wakefulness, 0 0.05 of blood alcohol concentration equals to is about the same. 18 hours of wakefulness, ability to problem solve drops 30%. So just think, if you've been up 12 hours, if I got up at 5, at 5 o'clock I've been up 12 hours, Add another thought, you know, so uh, from there, as the evening progresses, the longer you're up, like say if you're out on a Friday night, you know, Fridays I find is the time where you're thinking, oh, excellent, I can sleep in tomorrow morning, I'm going to stay up late. Your ability to do things, the reaction times, problem solve, focusing, certainly has decreased, right? Because you are so much more fatigued. So when we talk about as dangerous as alcohol, so we talk about 17% or 17 hours awake. So if you've been awake 17 hours, your blood alcohol is, is the same as someone with a blood alcohol level of 0 0.05. In Newfoundland, what happens at 0 0.05? If someone is uh, stopped and they're, they have 0 0.05, there's a suspension of their license, right? The next one is 21 hours of awakefulness. It equals your reaction and your body reacts to someone who's had a blood alcohol of 0 0.08. That's when someone's charged with impaired. So people are working within those limits. Then the last one, 24 to 25 hours, your body is feeling like someone who has 0.10 blood alcohol level. So just to give you an idea, right, of how your body reacts. So the impairment is certainly there. The next factor we're going to look at is our circadian rhythm effects. So our circadian rhythm is basically our 24-hour internal clock and is running in the background of your brain and it cycles between sleepiness and alertness at regular intervals. So you may have heard it called your sleep-wake cycle. What happens is our bodies produce melatonin in the night and that's when our bodies are telling us it's time to go to sleep. Uh, so anyone in the afternoons, I'm glad I don't have an afternoon session, <laughs> one to three. <laughs> what about when you're at your desk and you've had a big lunch? One to three. Do you feel like you can nod off? Have a good sleep? How many people have you seen anyone nodding off at their desk, right? Especially if they had a heavy lunch. That happens so much. And another time that our body is telling us we need sleep is between two and four. That is when we should be asleep. That's our biggest dips. So that's some of the things we look at when we look at our circadian rhythm. So when we look at incidents that occur, it's great to be, as an employer or anyone out there, what time did those incidents happen? Do you make sure that you capture that information? From there, you can look into cues. You know, was it something that happened between two and four when our body should be asleep? You know, was that person fatigued? 
And the same thing in the afternoons, right? That's the times that you look at. Because our bodies are just, like you say, that internal clock. Okay, next one. This is a common one we see. We got our morning larks or our night owls. Morning larks. How many people are here morning larks? Between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. That's their sleep patterns. Yep, I am. I got to tell you. I'm a morning person up between 5 and 5.30. And if I'm up late, 10.30 is late for me to go to bed, right? I'm like, yeah, okay. Okay, what about the rest of our night owls? Oh, hands up to you guys. Like you say, uh, between 1 a.m. and 9 a.m., you guys are the ones who can tackle anything in the evenings. When I get home, I'm if I can clear away the dishes, I'm good, right? Cook supper, clear away, and then I'm getting ready to go to bed because I know I can't do anything, right? So this is called your chronotypes, right? So this is important. We need to be able to work our lives around this, right? So make sure that you're sleeping and you're doing your work that matches your chronotype. Decisions to be made if you're a morning lark, that's the time. That's the time you do your best work. If you're doing a project, you've got something due at a certain deadline, work on it first thing in the morning. Leave the other stuff that doesn't require that focus and energy for the afternoon sessions, right? All right, the next one we'll talk about is, it's a pretty broad topic, medical, psychological conditions, illness, and drugs. These can produce fatigue on their own, or they can disrupt the quality and the quantity of your sleep and wakefulness and result in fatigue. So some of the things that we look at, um, diabetics that are here hypoglycemic, right? That may produce fatigue, pain medication, um, allergy meds. What about anti-nauseous gravol? Those medications that are out there, they're gonna produce fatigue. And then we got the other ones that disrupt our fatigue. Uh, anyone with a cold and flu, depression, anxiety, also caffeine, alcohol. So those are the things that we look at. The last topic that a lot of people may hear of are the four sleep disorders. The first one is insomnia. Cannot fall asleep or stay asleep. They go to sleep and then they wake up two or three o'clock in the morning and then you can't get back. Um, anyone, I know a lot of my friends um, at my age, I'm not dating myself, but pre-menopausal, that age group now, a lot of people are saying they can't sleep. They've got insomnia. They wake up and they're laying in bed, watching the clock, and they can't get back to sleep. You know, body changes. So we got ways to, to help with that. But, you know, that's out there. You know, that happens a lot. And even people who are younger, it, it's, it occurs. The next one we've got is obstructive sleep apnea. So that is a breathing disorder, and it is the narrowing of our throat or our airway. And, you know, um, 10 seconds or more, people have stopped breathing. One of the guys I was talking to before I came up here, he said there's a minimum, I think, before insurance covers your CPAP machine is 15 stops or breaks throughout an hour. He had 12, so he wasn't a candidate for his insurance to cover it. But that's a lot, 15 breaks of 10 seconds. So that's one of the things that we look at, you know, in relation to sleep. If you have sleep apnea, you're not getting good quality sleep. Um, another one uh, related to sleep apnea is the snoring. Uh, I'm a self-confessed snorer. I, my husband is like, oh my God, he touch, pushes me in the nighttime. Doesn't matter. I can snore on my side, on my back, any position. Anyone else can relate? Yep. So what I was able to find a device, this is a mouth guard. It's just a, a piece of, uh, I guess, a molded plastic that uh, you put in boiling water. And it just 
brings my jaw ahead a couple of millimeters. And within that, it opens up my airway. And this could be uh, keeping you and your partner in the same bed. <laughs> All right? I tell you, I, the first night I used it, I did not snore. And now it's something that I use every night. Because for me, I see the benefits of it. I'm not snoring anymore. I'm not disrupting his sleep. But I'm also getting big, big, oh, sorry, better quality sleep for me. I'm waking up more refreshed, alert, and I know overall I'm feeling better. So, you know, snoring is something too that's there that we can uh, improve on. Um, another one, restless leg syndrome. Anyone who has experienced this or who's had someone with this, it's like that creepy, that crawling, the pulling, it's just, and it happens when you're getting ready to go to sleep. And it, and it also can wake you up through the night. And the last disorder that we look at is narcolepsy. So that's that excessive daytime and they just fall asleep right away. I don't know anyone with narcolepsy, but I can only imagine how hard it is to function with a, um, an, I guess a, a disorder like that. And medications are, I think, are one of the things that we try to use for that one. All right, so that's some of our sleep disorders. So why do we need to manage this stuff? As employers out there, you know, the T can impact work performance. We know we're not performing at our top notch, right? Most accidents occur, like I said before, between 12 and six and one and three. So that 12 hour, that night shift, and also in the afternoons. Also, it leads to serious health consequences. We wanna take care of our bodies, right? We only got one of these. We wanna do what we can to live a long and healthy life. So that's a big one, right? Also, it also impairs human performance and leads to accidents, results in losses. And then we look at the costs, the accidents and the major incidents that occur. Also, um, affects the performance. Near misses is another indicator. How many people have a system in place where they capture near misses, right? So this is when something could have happened. Fatigue-related accidents are usually serious when a person has fallen asleep, right? People driving. How many times? You know, we've we've also we've seen in the news this past year even, right? People fatigued, death uh, in motor in uh, motor vehicle accidents. So what I mentioned before, it's a good practice to check the time of when your incidents occurs. I know on some systems. When we report your, your incident, it asks for a time. So be cognizant of that and make sure that they're putting in the exact time of the incident because I've seen people just put in haphazardly 12, 12 noon, and you know that may not be the correct time at all. If fatigue is present, the risks of safety are risks to safety are present and there are hidden costs. So what are the hidden costs? Minor incidents and near misses, they're gonna cost an employer money. Illness, labor manage, labor and your management relationships. We all know, right? Morale, organizations, culture. We talked about culture this morning, how important it is to focus on this. Well-being of your staff. Also, retention and recruitment. Making sure you got people coming to your organization and then keeping them. So those are some of the hidden costs and your reputation. As employers out there, you want to be the one who's saying, you know what? We do have a fatigue management program and we care about you and we want to make sure that we're taking care of you. So guys, I'm just going to give a couple of incidents that have occurred now of um, things and through the investigations, what we've seen. Um, we've got one here that happened in Las Vegas. Has anyone been to Las Vegas and done those tours, the helicopter tours? So this was one, uh, it was a pilot and four passengers 
and there was a loss of control and was a fatality of all five of them. What the investigation found was that the hardware was improperly secured. So that was a tragic accident that happened. And what we determined the day before this incident occurred, there was a mechanic and an inspector brought on, on early. They were supposed to be off for three days. They were off for two. And they also got called back in uh, on an earlier shift. Their regular shift was two o'clock in the afternoon and they ended up having to come in at six in the morning. So from there, we look at everything. First, we looked at the pilot. That was one of the things that they investigated. Was he a person who was fatigued? Did he have any illnesses, any conditions? And it came that no, he didn't have anything. So then the next step was the other two people involved was the mechanic and the inspector. When we look at their sleep wake cycles, their times, their sleep patterns, uh, the mechanic, he only slept five hours before he went to work that next day on the, say, on December 6th. The incident occurred on the 7th. So he didn't have his adequate amount of sleep and he was awake a lot earlier. So his circadian rhythms were off. He had early awakenings. Um, the other thing is that he had a, a change, right? That change in your circadian rhythm. So that was one thing. Then we had the inspector. Same thing. He was up for a long period of time. I think he had, he had to report to work six hours earlier. So, but his sleep patterns were so uh, changed. So that was another thing that they said. So they were, bedtimes weren't consistent and they didn't have the adequate amount of sleep. So there was acute sleep disruption, circadian rhythms were affected. And unfortunately that brought attention to his focus and attention of putting on the parts that were in place, which in turn caused the, uh, the accident from occurring. So that's one of the things that can happen. All right, next one wasn't anything catastrophic, but it could have been. This is a near miss. How many people are flying? And now, thank goodness, I, I'm thankful, well, sorry, I'm thankful when I hear the, the air, the pilot is, uh, your flight is delayed because it's fatigue and they don't have anyone else to replace you because that's when you want someone to, uh, make sure that they're taking care of you. That fatigue is something that's important. We had a flight from Toronto, from Pearson, and it was going to San Francisco. So this incident occurred. It was 12 o'clock San Francisco time. That meant three o'clock Toronto time. So I'm just gonna show you what happened. We had, this plane was getting ready to land. They were going to be landing on the runway and they were mistaking a taxiway for a run runway. So I'm going to show you the video here now. From clear to land runway two, right? There's no one on Up in that place. far corner there. Look. This guy going. See He's the plane the coming in? And can they go around? And they go around. I can't. Looks like we're lined up. And now he's coming right back up again. That taxiway, that taxiway had four planes full of passengers. The planes were all fueled and ready to go. They said that was a, could have been a near miss of, you know, bring it back here. That would have been uh, that was one of the biggest near misses in the decade. It was amazing. And basically, what they were saying through the investigations, there was a confusion with the lights of the co-pilot and the, and the captain in misrepresenting the uh, taxiway. They thought that was 
where they were going to land. So through the investigations, they found out the first officer, he was awake for 12 hours. Then our captain, he was awake for 19 hours. This happened in 2017, before any of these, the fatigue rules came into place in Canada, right? So that continuous wakefulness, and also they were awake during their circadian trough, that time in the night when they should have been asleep. Those were the things that were found out were important, right? So that was a total near miss. And so from there, you know, finally Canada came online with some of the other, I guess, uh, pilots in North America. All right, so moving right along. Okay, so organizational benefits. So there are benefits to the organization by managing fatigue, productivity, and health and safety of our staff. So reduction in direct costs by sick leave, by assessing sleeping problems, right? You know, maybe you can put a, a program in place, you know, making people aware. I know they do free sleep studies here in Cornerbrook. I'm sure out here on the East Coast as well, right? Reduction in healthcare claims. Improves the morale and leads to less turnover and recruitment problems. Improves the memory and creativity of your staff. Alert and healthy workforce is more efficient and can improve the bottom line. Um, also, when people aren't fatigued and they're at work, you're getting less absenteeism and also less presentism. So cyber loafing, has anyone heard that one? They're there, but they're on their phones, they're on their internet, you know, they're scrolling through Facebook, shopping, they're at work, but they're not really there. Also, the other thing is less attentional errors, right? We're seeing less of those. Health and safety, less catastrophic and fatal accidents, less major incidents that are occurring, and the minor ones too, less near misses and then our less injuries for people. So we should see a, a return on our investment if the organization brings forward fatigue management initiatives, right? Do you guys have a fatigue management program in place? Or is that something that you're monitoring? Are you looking at your staff's uh, wake cycles? You know, are, they, are you wondering how long they've been at work and how long they've been awake? So those are the things that we would look at, right? Making sure you've got those logs in place. You know, food, sleep is for sissies, right? How many have heard, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? That's not it, right? Sleep is so important. We need that to regenerate, right? We need sleep to function the next day and to function well. And that's what we're looking for. So next, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to try to get this as fast as I can. This is my favorite part, personal strategies. What can we do to make sure that we're getting enough sleep? So optimizing your sleep quality and quantity by sleeping in a calming environment. You know, make sure that room is your sanctuary. For me, I make sure on the weekends, that's one of the things that I'm gonna to try to tidy away. You know, cause throughout the week is a dumping ground, you know, workout clothes is here, jeans are over there. That's the time I'm gonna make sure I'm cleaning it up and this is the place where I sleep. And that's the other thing. You know, anyone got TVs in their room, right? TVs are, you know, we try to make sure our bedroom is the place for sleep. And well, one other thing, but <laughs> mostly sleep. <laughs> um, the other one, use silicone ear plug, ear plugs to block noises, right? If you do have a spouse that's snoring, do you use earplugs? And do they work? Awesome. <laughs> Good. Um, also, sound generator to drown noise, right? For me, I'm traveling. So last night before I went to bed, I was right by the elevator. I'm like, oh, I should have asked for a different room. But I put an app on my phone and it played uh, just some rain and I was okay. What's the temperature? You know, you can open up the window to cool your room down or put on the air conditioning. The humidity, you may want to use a vaporizer. And also guys, 
we talked about your chronotypes. If you're a night owl and you're saying, oh, I'm going to try to go to bed early and you're laying in bed and you can't get to sleep, don't stay there, right? If you're someone, oh, I'm going to go to bed early and you're just laying there, what happens is your brain connects to you laying in bed and not sleeping. You need to go to bed when you're getting tired. So make sure you're sleeping to your chronotype. And if you do wake up throughout the night and you're laying in bed watching the clock, if you've been there for at least 20 minutes or more, go out in the living room and change your environment. Don't go on your iPads or your phones unless you've got a blue light, something that's going to stop that blue light because that's going to suppress the melatonin that your body's producing. And we want to make sure that that is producing. So make sure that either pick up a magazine, crossword, a book, something like that, and then getting tired, go back to bed. Also, anyone use their watches to track their sleep? You know, yeah, me too. I, I, I love gadgets. I'm the gadget girl. And I love seeing how many hours of sleep I had. I was like, yes, right? But then you're thinking, it really does work. It tracks your movements through the night, right? I'm thinking, oh, yeah, maybe that's why I'm so tired. Because I was I didn't sleep sound. That quality of sleep wasn't there. So next one, shift workers. Sleep as much as possible the night before your night shift, if you can do that, right? Um, sleep to your you want to get in that nocturnal time. That's when your body wants to sleep. So after a night shift, you know, don't get up and do all your housework. You're coming home eight o'clock in the morning and doing chores, going to the grocery store. I've seen people up to Dominion. I'm thinking, you're just getting off work and you're here? Go home and go to bed, right? But they got to get things done, I guess. But practice going to sleep right away wake at noon, have something to eat, and during your post-lunch dip, that circadian trough, have another nap, right, and get prepared for the night. And then the next time you're asleep, if you're not getting good quality sleep, sleep longer. Okay, so like we said, bedtime. So this is the, the wrap-up. I got a few minutes left. Do I, Krista? All right. So what about the same wake up time? Do you have the same time that you get up during the weekday and on the weekends? No, you sleep in? Yeah. No. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to I'm trying to do this one cuz I'm I'm up 5:30, so now on the weekends I'm trying to get up around 6:30. Not exactly the same, but an hour in a difference. So just trying to keep that same cycle. Uh, create a, a pre-sleep ritual that takes 45 to 60 minutes before you go to bed. So one thing is put the electronics away. Computers, iPads, phones, put them down. That blue light is suppressing the melatonin our body's producing. Also, what about, you know, does anyone have a, a snack before they go to bed? Just like our children. We have that snack, brush your teeth, story, and bed. We want to have that same type of routine built in into our lives. You know, if you want to, you know, count backwards from your wake-up time to about nine hours. That's what time we should be going to bed. Wait until you are drowsy, right? Don't go into bed, like I said, when you're wide awake. And the other thing is don't watch the clock, right? If you're watching the clock, get up and do some reading. Another one. Within 30 minutes of waking up, expose your eyes to light, some type of light, you know, make sure things are getting harder now. I guess next week our clocks go back, so it'll be, it'll be a little lighter now when we wake up, but right now when you're waking up, it's probably still dark, right? Um, how many people have a nap in the daytime? Yep, we got our nappers. And do you find that impairs your sleep when you go to bed that night? No? Oh, you're good. <laughs> For me, I'm, I'm so fooled up. Even 20 minutes, I can't get to sleep on my normal time, right? What about caffeine? Who uses caffeine to keep them awake throughout the day? Does it work? Are you overexposed, right? You know, are you drinking too much caffeine and it's not even working for you, 
right? So there's a fine line that we're that you need, right? That morning coffee. If I have caffeine after two o'clock, I'm awake then, and it fools up my my sleep. For me, uh, I keep these in my car. It's like a Listerine strip, but it's a hundred milligrams of caffeine. Uh, when I'm driving and I'm getting sleepy, I'll use these. Right? These are a little go-to trick that uh, I've learned along the way. Um, coffee, like you say, is my go-to. I just have one in the morning, but also, a lot of people are out there drinking the, um, I guess, the canned uh, caffeinated drinks. And I've got a powdered caffeinated supplement that I take before I work out. And those are the things that I use strategically to get me through the rest of the day. You're exercising regularly, but you don't exercise before you're getting ready for bed. That's not going to work. It's not going to help your sleep. And like I said before, make sure your bedroom is conductive to sleep. Now, guys, this is the last part of our presentation. And there's a couple of gauges that employers can use. Um, this presentation is recorded. Um, and if anyone needs any of the copies of these, I certainly can provide them. But they're sleep scales. One is the Epworth Sleepiness Scale. And the other one is a Karolinski Sleep Scale. And they're designed to assess your daytime sleepiness. So it was great for employers to help identify. Um, so I'm just gonna, Krista, we're at time now. All right, so like you say, and they are scientifically researched, right? They're validated. So if you ever want uh, questions about them or copies, let me know. I can certainly send them to you. And the same with the, um, the last one, our Karolinski sleep sleepiness scale. And that one is a self-reported, right? Nine point system. So on that note, nobody fell asleep. Thank you so much. Please make sure you're getting a good night's sleep tonight. See if we can get even seven hours, right? And uh, from there, you know, making sure that we're taking care of our, our workers and uh, everyone is getting a good amount of sleep. All right, guys, thank you so much.